Hello from wherever you are, and welcome to Let's Play Games. I'm John McFarland, Adult Services Librarian for National Public Libraries, and I hope you'll join me in learning or rediscovering some of the more common and uncommon games out there. This is the second of our three episodes on the board game Go. Last time, we covered 9 by 9 Time to take it up a notch. 13 by 13 Let's make some space. Let's get stuck in. So, last time we played on this 9x9 board. I think it's time, let's step it up a bit. We're not to 19x19, but let's stick with this 13x13 and kind of go over the general concepts again. Just so you know where we're starting from, if you didn't watch last episode and you're starting here, don't worry, I'm gonna get you set up. This game is all about acquiring space and turf, which now we've added an extra lovely little layer here. You place stones on the points, not in the center, and your opponent will also play stones. Your idea is to cordon off space, and eventually, be in a position to try, keyword try, and capture some of these stones. Why is that important, by the way? With these captured stones, when we get to the end of the game, and by the way, this is another one of those games that is considered perfectly honorable when you know it's over to resign, um, just so you're not playing an incredibly losing game, situations so you don't have to worry about oh i've got to play this through the end literally don't because people for thousands of years have been playing this game and the moment they know they're beaten they stop you know why because they can reset play again try again or talk about the game as it unfolded so notice here i've gotten things pretty quickly set up to where i'm just trying to go for aggressive capturing of something And from here, this is where sometimes you get into that fun little spot of trying to capture pieces aggressively while cutting off the avenues of retreat. Notice how each time that I'm playing a piece here, I'm only leaving one possible move. And this is where you're usually going, uh-oh. Notice just with aggressive playing and trying to counter, we created this situation where your pieces had to keep moving or else be captured. This is another key element of this game where you are going to sometimes admit defeat somewhere in order to try and set up elsewhere. This is actually a concept that we'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment, but at its core, this is what's called a ladder. I was playing on opposite sides each time to remove the available liberties to one. So let's scooch back here a second. So let's say I played here earlier. Well, that would have been a mistake. Why is that? We've played here. In general, if I continue playing here, I've cordoned off some space, but now instead of having one remaining liberty, I go to having one, two, three liberties. The most you can do is cut me off to two. But because of this, you can actually start escaping and yes, fine, we've cut it off to one liberty again. This is not necessarily how you would play it, but there is a way to escape. So you are moving back and forth with the player in order to gain space, create eyes of territory that can't be captured, something that would look like, at its core, this. As long as this is surrounded by other pieces where you create over here and you create no 
possible avenues, you can actually create a situation where you have that corner side, it's yours, no escaping, it's fine. So that is sort of the review in a nutshell because I wanted to make sure that I went over a lot of those core concepts, especially as we start adding a little more to the game. And I had talked about the situation of Atari last time at the end, and especially double Atari. This is another part of the game that's, to me, really fun, because now you are creating spots where the turf is being pushed in, and your opponent really doesn't have much choice but to play elsewhere. So here's one of the differences. On a 9x9 nine nine board is one of the common starting boards, because you learn here, this is sort of like going into a quick uh, skirmish, if you want to take the uh, Warlord example of where this game originated from. Here, you are in a position where you're going to have to start playing against your opponent fairly quickly. There's no dodging or getting around. On a 13 by 13, we've opened up some space. So, real quick, let me get set up an initial example from our last game. And I can show you kind of why on a larger board, it becomes a little easier to win somewhere and lose elsewhere. One second. So here was the example I used at the end of the last episode. We had here the double Atari that I had talked about. Notice how on that previous board, that is a lot of space that was pretty much almost half the board already kind of covered. Here, it's about a quarter of the board. So there's more wiggle room and space to work with. So you say, okay, I'm gonna defend here. You're gonna capture over here. And that goes over here. So now what? Yes, you've created a situation where this is exposed and potentially gonna be lost, but you still have ways to escape this direction and escape this direction or start completely elsewhere. So you've got a bit more room to work with when it comes to this setup. All right, what I'm gonna do is I want to set up something I personally love calling the pitch invasion, if you're familiar with soccer terminology, and show you a little bit of how this can escalate really quickly, especially when somebody has cordoned off all of their space. One second. So last episode, you were probably wondering, I never talked about where the game actually originated from. All I said was China. That's because there's still a debate to this day as to where it truly came from. There are some interpretations where people say that it was used as a, a divination device, similar to how we would think of tarot cards in the West in modern times. We also heard that it was an emperor trying to uh, teach their son patience and enlightenment. It's taught me that, I'll say as much. There's also the origin of it being a tutoring strategy for Chinese warlords, which kind of persists to this day. Uh, it's a very educational tool to teach you about space and turf and territory, so I totally get it. But. That is why there's always going to be some ambiguity as to these events with regards to its developments. Maybe one day we'll find an authoritative piece of information, but that day is not today. So this is what I like to call the pitch invasion. Like I said, soccer terminology. So notice how the board here, I could have moved it down here for this example, but I wanted to scrunch it up for space. So here, white is trying to cordon off their space. You're thinking, not bad, okay, not so great that they're hemmed in, but they've got also on a nine by nine board, this is almost away. There's some opportunities here, but black is the one currently playing. And I'm gonna play one piece where you're gonna see that something's about to be captured. It's really a matter of what right here. 
So you think, okay, that that's it's not too bad, right? Well, all right, fine. These pieces are connected. We're we're good. We're good. Well, this is where sometimes moves that take a turn or two can develop over time because now not only do we have a double Atari, but we have a situation where you get to make your choice. Do you lose one piece or two? Okay, you say fine. I'm gonna we're gonna combine this because I don't want to lose two. Well, all right. Now you've lost one. You've got two differently connected groups. There's not really a way to immediately clap back because there's no remaining one liberty things aside from, okay, you've got here. So awesome, you've captured the one piece. But now black gets to stay on the initiative and start moving in and play just about anywhere else they want. So that way they can keep control of that initiative. They can keep trying to cordon off these pieces. Can't play in there and remove their liberties. So now you play here. And now you've got this corner group that's absolutely stuck and rapidly losing the control of their liberties. And I'm just going to, you know, play some pieces as an example here. What are you supposed to do with this? This is where even through just one stone, you can actually break through an entire wall. And these are basically two separate groups. Uh, and at best, you're going to be able to say, all right, this is emergency time. Connect here. Now you're starting to run out of space and say, okay, we'll go here. White plays maybe there. Black says, okay, fine, we'll shore up here. And white, actually right there and right there. If black. So see how even playing this, okay, well, I've got two eyes, right? Well, not really, because at this juncture, I mean, this is about all you can do to preserve those pieces. Still only two liberties remaining. You're talking about, in this very quick example, it escalating out of control. And now what was an entire group is now almost completely surrounded and probably dead here very soon. So think for the concepts of living or dead. Uh, and that factors into a lot of your decisions because at any point, well, black is doing what's called incente. Um, in chess, you would hear the term tempo. They have the initiative. They are one to two to plus number of moves ahead of you. This means that you are now having to deal with the consequences of having a split group. Here's where having a larger board helps. Losing here is not great, but if you could preserve maybe some eyes here, just a little bit of territory, make sure that black doesn't get any further encroached, start playing over here, maybe go for these corners. In general, as a concept, you're going to want to do a couple of things. It's a good idea to start playing for corners. So play wherever you can try and gain a corner, which is what white was trying to do in that example. Black was kind of playing the middle, but typically it's get the corners, get the sides, and then get the middle. Because by that time, you've got multiple avenues to pursue getting towards the middle. This is what makes it a dynamic, a complex game. A couple more examples. And I want to go a little bit more into the ladders and nets. One second. So earlier in the episode, I showed you unintentionally the example of a ladder, but let's discuss it a bit more in depth. Notice this piece right here. Uh, it, let's assume that everything's been played evenly so far. Uh, Black's now in a position where, okay, well, if white had another play here, no more liberties captured. All right, fine. I've created two liberties. Now what you're going to do as white is create a position where black 
cannot play anything more than what is obligated to be played. And if there's nothing but corners over here, you've got a good position. So in theory here, okay, fine. They've only got one Liberty left. Now they have three. So this is part of your mistake. This is also why you're encouraged to think through your turns. Think how many stones would I need to capture these pieces? How many liberties do they have? How can I prevent them? So now notice, all right, we're back to having one liberty. Aw shucks. So for here, same problem. If you placed here, so you gotta kinda alternate going down and you're trying to push them in a ladder down where they continue to only be able to play what is obliged for them to play. And if you can just kind of remember this alternating strategy, you're usually pretty effectively set up. Almost trapped. Black plays here. And white plays here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stones captured in just those series of moves. This is another reason why it behooves you to pay attention to where you are on the board, how much danger you're in. This is the strategy element that you get through practicing this game. I'm showing you the general concepts of things to avoid, things to try and go for if you see the opportunity, but entire game strategy because of the numerous ways in which this can play out, showing you an example step-by-step -step game is really hard here because there's no hard and fast rules depending on how the game develops. So what I'll say is if you get to about, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Some of it is the mistake of where you're playing in the first place. Let's assume you had some stones over here. You played relatively the same. Yes, they've captured, they've captured this one. Just give it up. If you have other plays on the board, this is actually not bad right here. Okay, so at most they can capture this one stone. Cool. What else have they done for control of the board? At this point, they've locked off this one space, which if any of these get taken, that space is gone. These three aren't really good for blocking anything off. Meanwhile, over here, being able to play pieces across the board is gonna be so much more important because just take a look at where we're kind of at right now. So this spot only has two liberties left. With here, you've blocked it off. Let's say you play over here. In one move, you've created two more potential spots that you can have. It also allows you to play defensively, where if somebody's about to encroach upon you, all right, now I've made a shape of five then has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine available liberties. So creating open space is great and creating situations where you can make sure no one attacks it as long as this stone is alive is an excellent way to develop the board for yourself. So let me set this up another way, give you another example so that way you can see a way in which things can end a little better. One second. So here's what I mean about having more awareness of the board and how it can impact. Only thing that has changed is I've flipped it around to the other side and I've added this stone here. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna assume that it is Black's turn to play. We're gonna play here. And now we're gonna do our usual thing of, all right, you know, ladder, There's one left. Now, here is where having somewhat control of the board kind of helps. It does not matter whether you play on this side or whether you play on this side. They are now one away as black from making a connection. And instead of having only one Liberty left like before, now they've got one, two, three. So yes, you know, at this point, you could continue 
trying to... This is where I talk about that, that tempo. You know, I could do this if I just had one more move. I could do this if I had just one more move. That will be something that probably occurs a lot in your head. So, there's another concept that I want to talk about that is sort of almost the reverse of a ladder because that involves some chasing. Instead, sometimes you can let it come to you. Let's talk about the net. Let me get it set up. Regardless of how it came about or who started it, the first commentary that we have on Go is actually somebody giving a um, almost play-by-play -play commentary in the Zhou Zhuan, which was a historical commentary from the period. That dated around the second century BCE. You also see in some of the ancient tombs which have been excavated over time, actual Go boards that were made out of clay. One catch. The boards were 17 by 17. So we're always going to have a little bit of ambiguity to this game, no matter which way you slice it. As I mentioned, nets are what I want to talk about next. So this is kind of a way to reverse. And let me set up this situation. You're trying to notice I'm talking about the corners a lot. The corners are a massive part of the early game because if you can get control of a corner, you can use that as a base to move down the sides and then towards the middle. This is how the game progressively develops, but almost all of these positions are able to be done from different portions of the board. They, we don't even require the edges, but a lot of your game is gonna be played at the edges until late game. Don't worry, we'll get there. So let's say you're kind of marking off this corner and you're white. You see, all right, there's some shapes here. I'm gonna try and cut in. See if I can put some pressure on one of these. If they can focus on one of them, I can try and attack the other. Now then, you're gonna see black plays here. Notice a lot of these moves have been dependent on pieces being sort of right next to each other. This is where space consideration and mapping it out, a little spatial awareness as you play this game helps. You know what the next moves are probably going to be. Well, there are two liberties right there. In theory, I could place it in Atari, but the next move, you haven't really generated much out of it. Instead here, we're gonna let uh, white give us a little more advantage. This thing, all right, cool. I'm gonna go down here and see about connecting to over here with this piece, almost like a reverse version of ladder. Well, Black's say, mm, not so fast, my friend. Now they're down to one liberty. Uh-oh. So White says, okay, no, 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 we're, we're still good. We're still good. But from here, where we're at is, they're already hemmed in. That one piece played diagonally set up almost a perfect trap for Black to take three pieces. Not half bad. And then from here, it gets worse. At some point, you know, in theory, by the way, white could play here to kind of mess up because they were part of this, but you're not recreating the same position. But that's also now too away from being captured. This is the point where you'd want to start developing somewhere else, especially on a large board. And later, black will probably do this. It creates a small wall and it creates these spaces with no liberties. They're going to have to attack over here if they have any chance of normalizing. Work as a concept? All right, give me one second. Let me set up one that's a little more complex as so you can see where I'm going. So now that we have that basic concept, let's add a little bit more spice into it. White's got a bit more protection this time. Black is two separated groups, but they at least have some of the side. This really hasn't developed anywhere yet, but it's prevented it from being captured. So it was probably played like here and then here. White snaking, so okay, I'm gonna play here. From this point, now we are in a position to set up shop. Now, in theory, you could play here, but that just kind of reduces your liberties. 
I'm going to play here to see about connecting my pieces a little more aggressively. Well, not so fast. So you think, okay, fine. We're going to have ourselves a nice little shape here. Cool. Fine. Uh, not so much. See how the pieces on the board eventually add up to where you are now making the decision between you're about to lose four pieces or five. Because if you play here, that is an absolute blunder. And yes, I'm stealing from test chess terminology there. So here, maybe you can set up at least a little better. So now you're making the decision of losing four versus losing five. And that was over the course of three moves. A lot of this sounds like it happens pretty quickly, right? Well, I want to teach you about one more thing today. We call it the snapback. One second. So snapbacks is one of the only rules that I struggle with sometimes. But remember I had talked about ko, in which you cannot repeat a position that is exactly the same. Snapbacks allow you to wiggle with that room. So let's take a look at the board. Uh, notice these two pieces who are in trouble that are one away from connecting to this entire group. That's a whole lot of liberties opened. Black's at least got it mostly covered. So you think, okay, as black, all right, fine, I'm gonna play here. You can't connect. White says, fine. I'm gonna capture your token. Well, I just captured your token. Everything's good, right? Wrong. Because I am not repeating a position, I go from, sure, I lost the one stone, but I also gain. And from here, now white says, all right, you're not getting two eyes on my watch. Okay, fine. From here, you're set up fairly effectively to where now white can't put a piece there. Yeah, white really can't put a piece there because they would then lose another two stones. At worst, you've filled in this space. At best, you've gotten five or six stones, or you've created a situation where they're gonna play elsewhere, try and defend from you, and you can create some eyes. Let me show you one more example of a snapback before we go today that's even larger. One second, let me set it up. So just one more example to show you how complex features can really add up. Now, I'm assuming this is the bottom of the board. I just wanted to get it set up for you before we go today. Now we can say, okay, we're trying to close liberties. This isn't an I by any stretch, so that's not great. Let's assume that this is the bottom of the board and this is off to the side. So what you're gonna experience now is some kind of dangerous play because black is going to play here. Why? Because see these stones in the middle? If white plays here, they've connected this whole big feature and that's impossible to capture. So we want to avoid that. We're saying, all right, cool. We're playing there. White says, oh, well, that leaves that group with one liberty left. So I better capture this piece. Awesome. Great, I'm saved, right? Here's where the snapback comes into play. And black plays here. They've removed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven stones. This is why these complex features get set up towards endgame, and you want to make sure you preserve through making eyes, through corners as to seeing how these pieces will manage to live another day. This is what makes Go such an infinitely complex game, and it gets deeper more and more you learn. So I had mentioned the second century. I'm gonna move on to the sixth century now. This is the first time in which you have almost a treatise on how the board game is played and strategies you can try. So people have been talking about this game for a long time. Japan absolutely 
has this board game as an essential piece of its own history. You started to see this around the 8th century when a uh, nobleman who was studying in China brought the game back. It took a while, but somewhere around the 12th century, you started seeing a whole lot more commentary of it being an essential piece. Similar to Chinese aristocracy, it was the same with the Japanese aristocracy. This was an important game and required for those who are the educated. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for tuning in. Join me next time as we continue to expand our horizons and expand our borders. Next time, we're doing 19 by 19. See you next time.